In the previous video, we discussed the complex concept of visual tracking and the synergy that must occur between muscles to generate the precision of eye movements. As with all other areas of the human body, there is the potential for errors in tracking to occur, resulting in one of a variety of conditions collectively known as strabismus. There can be a number of causes of strabismus, including damage to one of the three cranial nerves controlling eye movements. We'll consider each of these in turn with our discussion of the neurovascular components of the orbit and eye. Welcome back to this third and final segment in our discussion of the eye and which will be looking at the neurovascular supply to the orbit and the eye. There are three motor nerves supplying the muscles of the eye, a general sensory nerve supplying the contents of the eye, as well as the superior portion of the nasal cavity and forehead, and of course, the optic nerve. The major blood supply comes from the ophthalmic artery off the internal carotid artery. We'll look at each of these branches in turn as well as the expected effects of some of the cranial nerve palsies we are likely to encounter. The optic nerve is the second cranial nerve associated with the special sense of sight. The dendrites for the optic nerve are embedded in the upper layer of the retina and receive neural transmissions from the photosensitive rods and cones found in the deeper layers. The optic nerve travels back to the brain through the optic canal we discussed the path of the specific tracks in our session on the cranial nerves in a separate video. Damage to the optic nerve can result from excessive pressures within the aqueous chamber of the eye. This condition, referred to as glaucoma, can result in permanent blindness if not properly treated. The oculomotor nerve is the principal motor innervation to the eye. It passes through the superior orbital fissure, at which point it branches extensively to supply the superior middle, and inferior rectus muscles, as well as levator palpebrae superioris and the inferior oblique muscle. In addition to supplying alpha motor neurons to these muscles, the oculomotor nerve also supplies presynaptic parasympathetic fibers to the orbit, which synapse with postsynaptic fibers within the ciliary ganglion. These fibers are joined with sympathetic fibers originating off the internal carotid artery, to reach the eye through long and short ciliary nerves. These are the autonomics that supply the ciliary muscle controlling lens thickness and the iris controlling pupillary diameter. Damage to the oculomotor nerve results in loss of motor function. This paralyzes all but two of the ocular muscles, which are now unopposed in their function. This results in abduction of the affected eye due to the unopposed action of the lateral rectus muscle and depression of the pupil due to the unopposed action of the superior oblique muscle. This results in what is known as the down and out sign, which describes the position of the pupil on the affected side. Notice in the patient in the photo, the eyelid is also drooping due to the loss of the levator palpebrae superioris. In addition, the eye loses its parasympathetic function which results in a dilated pupil, even in response to light. The oculomotor is often susceptible to damage in association to certain types of brain bleed. As a result, shining a pen light into the eyes of an unconscious patient following head trauma can often assist with a diagnosis of neural trauma. If the pupils are equal and reactive, the oculomotor nerve and its associated parasympathetics are intact and functional. If one pupil is fixed and dilated, it's a red flag for neurotrauma and indicates a medical emergency. The trochlear nerve also passes through the superior orbital fissure. This small branch passes to the underside of the superior rectus muscle, which it innervates. Because of its role in intorsion and depression of the pupil, Trochlear nerve palsy typically results in a slightly elevated and extorted eye. To compensate, the patient will typically adopt a head posture that would normally require the affected eye to assume such a position. This allows the unaffected eye to match the orientation of the affected side, which reduces double vision for the patient. 
The final motor nerve to the orbit is the abducens nerve. As with the previous motor nerves, it also accesses the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. In this case, the nerve supplies the lateral rectus muscle. Due to the simplicity of the single muscle it innervates, abducens nerve palsy is probably the easiest to diagnose. In a resting position, the affected eye seems to deviate medially due to the unequal pull of the medial rectus muscle. As a result, patients typically present with their heads turned to the affected side to reduce double vision. Asking the patient to look in the direction of the unaffected side does not produce significant findings, but asking them to look towards the affected side demonstrates a clear inability to abduct the affected eye. One final nerve to discuss is the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. This also enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure, where it branches extensively to supply general sensation to the region. The largest of these branches is the frontal nerve, which can be found coursing superior to the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. As it reaches the front of the orbit, it splits into supraorbital and supratrochlear branches that continue superiorly, supplying sensation to the skin covering the forehead. Deeper within the orbit is the nasociliary branch. This gives off numerous branches to the eye itself that provide general sensation for the eye, such as pressure and pain. The nasociliary branch deviates medially as it runs anteriorly. Here, it gives off an infratrochlear branch that projects into the face, providing general sensation to the bridge of the nose. It also gives off anterior and posterior ethmoidal branches that supply the air cells within the ethmoid bone. The anterior branch continues into the nasal cavity and terminates as the external nasal nerve that also supplies the inferior skin of the nose. One final branch to note is the lacrimal nerve. This projects along the lateral aspect of the orbit, supplying general sensation to the lacrimal gland and surrounding soft tissue. As discussed in the video on the infratemporal fossa, it also receives parasympathetics originating off the facial nerve and sympathetics which regulate lacrimal secretions. Finally, note that the ophthalmic nerve also blends with ciliary branches discussed with the oculomotor nerve. Here, we can visualize the preganglionic parasympathetic axons associated with the oculomotor nerve entering the ciliary ganglion, where they synapse with postganglionic parasympathetic vessels that continue to the back of the eye. We can also visualize the sympathetics joining these nerves off the internal carotid artery. The sympathetics can course with either the long ciliary nerves associated with the ophthalmic branch of trigeminal nerve, or the short ciliary nerves associated with the oculomotor nerve. The major blood supply to the orbit is through the ophthalmic artery, which is the first branch of the internal carotid artery. From here, it provides a number of branches. The frontal and supraorbital arteries course anteriorly, exiting the orbit to supply the skin of the forehead. Anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries supply the medial orbital wall, while a zygomatic branch supplies the lateral orbital wall and lacrimal gland. In addition, a number of short ciliary branches project to the posterior aspect of the eye, penetrating the sclera to run in the choroid to supply the eye itself. A central branch will pierce the optic nerve to supply the retina directly. Although not shown here, it is important to remember that the inferior portion of the orbit is supplied by the infraorbital artery, which branches off the maxillary artery from the infratemporal fossa. Venous drainage is a little different from arterial supply. There are no valves associated with the veins of the face, so blood is free to travel in one of a number of directions. Blood is generally collected in either the superior or inferior ophthalmic veins. From here, blood can drain into the cavernous sinus, which in turn drains into the dural sinuses of the skull and ultimately into the external jugular vein. Blood can also collect inferiorly into the pterygoid plexus, which ultimately drains into the retromandibular vein. 
Blood can also course anteriorly, ultimately draining into the facial vein. That will do it for our discussion of the orbit. Up next, we'll move out posterolaterally to discuss the ear cavity and its associated structures. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.